I know you've been standing, but if you can, I stand and read the scriptures and uh, just two verses this morning and, uh, and let the Lord speak to our hearts. In uh, John chapter 19, verse 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with the sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. Father, we love you and thank you for this privilege again to just come and open your word and allow you to speak to us. And we just pray that you'll take your servant, Lord, and forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. And Lord, just we present ourselves as a vessel to serve your people. And we pray that each one of us will right now open our ears, our hearts, our minds, our eyes, and everything about us and just open up unto you that we might hear and receive what you have for us today. For it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Now we share, we got some first time people with us this morning. Uh, Back in January 2016 with the ministry I had with the RV ministry, I started a series of messages and I'm writing a book on it. And um, on the words of Jesus, the red letter words. And um, this is now 132 messages. And, but again, Lord has blessed it. It's working out. It's coming up to Resurrection Sunday. So just before that, we are blessed to be looking at the words that he spoke upon the cross. Today we'll be looking at the fourth word that he said upon the the cross, as he uttered these final words, are so important to us. Um, as Jesus was nailed to the cross, I would about 9 a.m. in the morning, he first uttered the three statements that we have been looked at already in Luke 23, 34. I think, did we have a slide for that? Um, he other Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then Luke 23, 43, he said, Today you shall be with me in paradise to the thief. And then in John 19, 26 and 27, he said, Woman, behold your son, and behold your mother. To John, as John took Mary to his home to take care of her. And then that around noon was this time. And darkness, the Bible says, fell upon the earth like a thick darkness. And it stayed there at about 3 p.m. And we looked at that last week in Matthew 27, 45 to 46, a statement at anguish as our Lord said, Eli, 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 my God, my God, as John interpretates it for us, why hast thou forsaken me? He screamed this out because it had been so dark for three hours of pitch darkness and so quiet. More than any of the other words Christ filth saying uttered from the cross that we just read about reveals to us his physical suffering. He said, I'm thirsty. In John 19, 28, 29, we have a distinct description of Jesus as a man. In high school, I did a, I just thought of that, I did a, a speech, and speech, I had a speech class. Don't know why, but I had a speech class. I wasn't going to be no preacher. I don't know why I took a speech class to do public speaking, but I did. And uh, I did a speech one time on Jesus the man. My teacher said, you did a good one, but I don't like it. <laughs> I don't want to see Jesus as the man. But you're going to find out, we need to see Jesus as the man. Too. He is God, 100% God, but he was 100% man. And this is one of those descriptions that we know he was man. You see, there should not be any doubt in anyone's mind that Jesus was not only God, but also very much man when he was here upon the earth. The six-hour time segment between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., while Jesus hung on the cross, sheds very clarifying light on his nature. Theologians have coined a title for Jesus Christ 
the Son of God, calling him theopatic person. The theopatric person. The term is a con combination of two Greek words, theos, of course, meaning God, and anthroposis, meaning man. This term is a very accurate description of the title of Jesus, God Man. Now, for in him dwelt undiminished deity and true humanity together. Examples that we can see that as we study his life, as human, humanity, he fell asleep because he was tired in the midst of a storm. But as deity, he stilled the wind and calmed the sea. As humanity, in him, he wept. The Bible said actually he groaned and he hurt within at the graveside of his friend Lazarus. He felt that pain of the separation that we experience as death. And he wept and he groaned with the end. But as deity, he raised him from the dead. Praise the Lord. You see, as he made the rain, he made the streams. But he on the cross said, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Now with this in mind, Let's look at the facts surrounding the statement, I am thirsty. Consider the facts there in John 28 to 29. John tells us Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled said, I am thirsty. Also John tells us that there was a full jar of sour wine standing there. So they put a sponge in the sour wine and put it upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to his mouth. Again, very important that we see this. Jesus knew that all things had been accomplished. This word know means to have all the facts and then recall them. He had all the facts and he recalled them. He knew in the mind of Christ were all the scriptures. He had been there from the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, Christ is there. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in the mind of Christ is all the scriptures that had ever been given. He had ready reference to them without getting down his computer like I have to sometimes to find a verse. He had ready reference to them. Everything had ever been written. And as he hung upon the cross and all that suffering stripped naked before the world and all the pain that he was enduring and his beard being plucked from his face and his body just a literal bloody mess as they had just literally whipped the skin off of his body. He considered each prophecy one at a time and concluded that all had been accomplished. You see, we can go back to John 13 and 3 and it tells us that Jesus Christ shared, just as he has shared the Lord's Supper and Judas had gone out to betray him. It says Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God. So Jesus knew it's time, it's now. Everything was accomplished. And there upon the cross, he said, I'm thirsty. <clears throat> Thirst is a terrible thing. Most of us have not really been thirsty. There's times I think we thought we were going to die probably. I can think of some times when out mowing the yard and so far away from anything wet. And, and maybe sometime when the preacher gets a... A sip of water and he's preaching and I know that's why I try not to that's why I keep my water over there because I've been out there <laughs> you know it's, oh well I wish I could have that but we've had that sense of thirst but we've never really been thirsty thirsty our Lord experienced the most torturing pain there is in the human body is when you're just so dry and parched 
You're so thirsty. David in Psalms 22 and Psalm 69 not only gives a description of his own need of hunger and thirst, but he also described the Messiah for us as well. In Psalm 69, 20, he says, Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I look for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, I found none. They also gave me gall for my food. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Now, this is a good description of Christ centuries later in his final hours. You see, explain this. In Matthew 27, 34, we know Jesus was offered a drink twice. In 12 hours, he was offered a drink twice. At Matthew 27, 34, at the beginning of his crucifixion, they had offered him wine mixed with gal. Wine mixed with gall is a narcotic, or narcotic. Y'all know I have word problems speaking, but it's a sedative. It affects you, dulling the senses. The fresh wine mixed with this gall was there, sort of to give the victim of crucifixion a little bit of relief. Jesus refused it. Jesus refused that first drink because he was to bear all the pain of our sins upon him with no sedative or no relief. And then the second time in John 19, 29, he was offered sour wine after he declared he was thirsty. And this is just minutes before his death. He has screamed those last words, my God, why is thou forsaken me? He now says I'm thirsty because he has considered all things in his mind. And he's fixing to tell us in his next two words what's really going to come. But the wine offered this time was different from that offered six hours earlier. This sour wine more or less was a vinegar a taste of vinegar. We were rubbing ribs down last night. I was telling Kenny, they're going to cook ribs for lunch today at the campground. And, and one of the things we had to do was rub them down with vinegar before we put the seasoning on them. That stinks. I'm glad I don't have to drink vinegar. <laughs> but taste it. This is a cheap wine. The cheapest drink available in that time, actually. They didn't have RC Cola or Double Cola. And most of y'all don't know what that back back my bag boy days, that was the cheapest drink you could buy. I mean, they were cheap. It wasn't that good. <laughs> and the soldiers put a sponge full of the sour wine on a 18 to 24 inch stick so they could reach up to his mouth and just sort of touch his lips with it. We learned two lessons from all this. Because this would help smooth this throat a little bit so he could make these last final statements that he's going to make. You see, Though this incident was very brief and the rest of the things we're going to look at for the next couple of weeks, his true humanity was really displaced. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Isn't it reassuring today as we live this life and all the suffering and pain that we think we experience, our heartache that we think when we think it's about us, that we realize it's nothing compared to what He has done for us. He understands. 
He understands when we talk about sometimes supervisors at work and other people that's never done the job maybe we do. They don't understand sometimes. We have people in authority sometimes that don't understand us, you know, because they've never been where we are. But praise the Lord, our Lord, He knows. He's had a body just like you and I. And he suffered in ways, praise the Lord, that we will probably never have to suffer. Please understand, without humanity, he could not have been qualified as a priest on man's behalf. He had to have that human body. But without his deity, he could not have qualified as priest on God's behalf. He came. You see, an interesting paradox is Jesus began, began his ministry while hungry. He went to the wilderness. And that's what Satan even used against him and said, you know, bow down to me and I'll make these stones bread for you. I mean, most of us would have fall real fast. Because he's hungry. But he didn't. And now he's ending his life thirsty. Both of these incidents focused on his humanity. His unselfishness was exhibited. His example to us. Jesus had been thirsty from the beginning. Studies show us that the trials that we've talked about in depth, and I try no, not to keep on, keep it on, but you need to know these trials were excruciating and they were painful. They were exhausting before the crucifixion. It lasted for 12 hours and during that time he was buffeted, he was beaten, he was spit upon, he was stripped naked, he was mocked. And at no point once it started was he ever offered a time to rest or a time of refreshment or no pity. No time. No, no time. And we should not overlook the fact that he only asked for a drink. At the very end, all the way through this, all the way through it, he kept considering everything that had to be done. And he considered you and he considered me. And he waited till he knew everything was in place before he thought of himself. We were probably never hang up on a cross. I said probably. <clears throat> but just take away the basics of our life that we personally enjoy and we soon become extremely irritable, don't we? <clears throat> we even become resentful and hostile when we don't have the little things we want. I share a testimony back at one point in my life between radio stations. I worked for Pepsi Cola for a little while. And I still drink my Pepsi. But um, that point, there were three times a day I would drink a Pepsi. I had them readily accessible to me, so why not? But I noticed on some days uh, I wasn't there where I could get my Pepsi. And I'd get irritable. <laughs> yeah, some of y'all were coffee, okay? We might or call it something else for y'all. But uh, get very irritable. And I mean, so you see what I'm saying? We could. So I, I went on a two year fast from anything caffeine. Like I said, I still drink my Pepsi today, but after two years, I taught my body. I, you belong to me, I don't belong to you. And that's what fasting is all about. Teaching our bodies, teaching our being. We belong to the Lord. And He controls who we are and who we want to be in Him. But again, you got to notice, He waited. He didn't complain like we do. 
He didn't get irritable. Jesus had taken the pain of death. He had taken the pain of hell. Jesus fulfilled all prophecy and put our needs before his needs. Not wants, but needs. He put his needs or our needs before his needs. Now, with this media-driven coronavirus, you probably already know, some of us talked about this throughout the church this morning. Some churches actually closed the doors this morning and tonight. Others are having internet or Facebook church, which is fine. Um, and by the way, we can do that. Uh, uh, this message will be on Facebook and uh, June will probably put it over on the uh, Poplar Springs page. It'll be on several Facebook channels. It'll be on the YouTube channel. It'll be out there. But, we, so we have access to things like that. And a lot of pastors actually put out there, they changed their message today from what they were going to preach earlier in the week to deal with the coronavirus thing. Um, as you can see, the Lord already gave me my message, but he did show me something. I had left a blank in my message right here. What's that for? Because I, Brother Kenny knows I send him and others my outline when I get it ready and um, so they can work on it. And I will do that for you, Rachel. We never talked about it. I keep thinking when you're doing it, I don't do that. But she, he puts it together for me or him and Cindy. And um, so I had it early. I, I really I think I had it done by Tuesday. I don't think I send it to you to Thursday, though, just before we left for the camp. But... Um, but I had a space in there, and there's no more slides, Kathy, that we need to go to now. You can put the first slide up there, actually, if you want to. I know there's some more scripture, but I'm going to go back. I've added some this morning. Because I had a space in there. I didn't know what need to go there. But I do know now. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, Friday night while we were leaving the camp, the Lord just really, okay, we can do this. Yes, a lot of concern about the coronavirus. There's concern on this media-driven coronavirus. And changes have been made. Will Graham, Billy's grandson, Billy Graham's grandson, said uh, yesterday, I believe it was, God, and he reminded us, has our days numbered? But it's our job to take care of our days, right? Be smart. If you're sick, stay home, okay? Stay home if you're sick. Just don't share what you got. You probably got the flu. There'll be more people die in this area, I'm pretty sure, with the flu than there will be a coronavirus. And we should always take care of what God has given us. But also, we have seen in this message that God, or Jesus, actually, God in the flesh, has taken the pain of death for us. Jesus has taken the thirst of hell. So we should, in Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing. Again, this I don't have the scripture for you, Kathy, on this, but again, thank you for being there. But be anxious for nothing, he says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Did you hear what he said? Be anxious for nothing. Worry is a sin. Preparation is okay. But to worry? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, and with the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, he will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And because the Lord has better things for us, we need to go on in Philippians 3.20. You see, we know, no matter what happens, for our citizenship is in heaven. This is not home. 
from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to the glorious body, His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to do all things in Him. We got this promise. This world is not home. We're just passing through. Actually, there's a better thing. There's better things for us, but we need to let him live through us until his time numbers our times. Let him be in charge, right? Beware. Because again, none of us are going to get out of this world alive. That's a fact, Jack. You're not going to get out of here alive. Either going by death or through the rapture. But until that day... We are instructed, and this is in our verse this week, Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness, of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand. Stand. Live. Live for the Lord. Don't crawl in a hole, but live. Be wise. <coughs> and that's a tickle. It's not a, I don't know, it's, I need my water. <coughs> but um, I'm about to close. Because of these instructions, you see, that we just have stand. We have a promise not to be anxious. He says, don't be anxious because we have a better life than this. Just be a witness. Let your life count for him. And Hebrews 13, 5 says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with what things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Hmm. What man, virus or anything else, can do to me? Stand in the Lord. He is my helper. He said he would never leave us. And some of us may someday be in another country or even here in America and be crucified or tortured for our faith. But you know what? Even in that, he said, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. So if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you see, Christ did all this for you that you can have life and have it more abundantly. If you're born again and you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you, have you really truly put him first in your life? Is he, very, is he the first and foremost in your life? I like what Psalms 42 1 says. It's always been one of my favorite verses. It talks about as a deer pants for water brooks, for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, oh my God. That's where we need to be. Be thirsty for Him. Not just thirsty for water today. Let's get that same little thirst that you're beginning to get right now. And you're beginning to swallow because I coughed and I said I'm getting a little dry. You know, but let's get that real deep thirst. As the deer pants for the water brooks, let's begin to pant and want him. Want him more. Him. Him. Want him and his word. Get in his word. Let him have control in our lives today. Would you stand with us?